For chapter 1, we are focusing primarily on defining terms and making sure that we understand properties well enough to be able to use them to define systems. First of all, it's important that we establish what we are trying to do in thermodynamics. Thermodynamics is the study of energy, and primarily for our purposes, quantifying it. We are playing energy accountants. We are trying to keep track of inputs and outputs so that we can come to an idea of what's happening to the whole. If you started your week out with $50 and you spent $20 and you gained $10, you would end your week with $40. Similarly, if the air in the room that I'm sitting in has 50 kilojoules of thermal energy and it gains 10 kilojoules by me sitting in it and talking to you and 20 kilojoules are lost to outside, the energy in the room would have dropped 10 kilojoules. When you're talking about thermodynamics, there is a little bit of a distinction between microscopic versus macroscopic thermodynamics, and that pretty much comes down to a difference of perspective. You can think of it like the difference between Lagrangian analysis and Eulerian analysis. Microscopic thermodynamics typically looks at the state of individual atoms or molecules, and then you come up with an assessment of the whole by summing together all of the individual molecules. You are looking at a kind of statistical perspective. Macroscopic thermodynamics is the perspective where you are looking at the entire thing. If you are considering an entire system by looking at its boundary with the outside world, as opposed to looking at what's happening on a very small quantum of energy and then adding them together, that is a macroscopic perspective. Our perspective is going to be primarily macroscopic. You may be familiar with some of the laws of thermodynamics. We are going to be using the first and second primarily, as well as, I guess, the zeroth. For our purposes, the zeroth law of thermodynamics means that if two things are in thermal equilibrium with one another, say A and B, and then one of those is in equilibrium with something else, say B and C, then the first thing and the last thing must also be in thermal equilibrium with one another. So, if A and B are in thermal equilibrium and B and C are in thermal equilibrium, then A and C must also be in thermal equilibrium. That's a very long-winded way of saying that if you're holding a thermometer inside and it reads 71.0 degrees Fahrenheit, and you take it outside and it reads 71.0 degrees Fahrenheit, then everything else being equal, the temperatures must be the same at both places. The first law of thermodynamics you must be familiar with already it is the law of conservation of energy. It says that energy can be neither created nor destroyed. It is so useful that we often just refer to it as the law of conservation of energy, but it is the first law of thermodynamics. When we apply a first law perspective to one of our analyses, what we're doing is saying, well, What's happening to the energy in this situation? We know it can't be created, and it can't be destroyed, so where did it go? If 5 kilojoules enters a system, and 2 of it leaves, then 3 kilojoules must be left in the system. The second law of thermodynamics is focused on the quality of energy. It says that energy has a magnitude, but it also has a quality. That quality represents the usefulness, the order, of the energy. And it also says that energy will naturally go from a state of order to disorder. To bring it from disorder to order requires an investment of energy. So an example of that would be to say, electricity is a higher quality energy than thermal energy. So it's easy to go from electricity to heat we can get almost 100% of our investment because the conversion happens very easily. It's easy to convert from a state of high-quality energy to low-quality energy. But to go from low-quality to high-quality, from, say, heat back to electricity, we have to invest something in the process. There is no way we're going to get 100% of the energy in heat to electricity. We pay a cost for that conversion. Another common question at this point is, what is energy? For our purposes here, it is 
best to describe it as the ability to do useful work. The best definition of energy from a physics perspective is probably that thing that is conserved when nature happens. But that's a little bit harder for us to wrap our heads around. We are applying energy terms to a specific problem in front of us. Similarly, it is not uncommon to consider heat as a type of energy, and it used to be that heat was the only type of energy. But we now know that heat is just one of many types of energy. And furthermore, we clarify that when we are talking about heat, we are usually talking about heat transfer. Heat transfer is dynamic. When heat is in something, we actually call it thermal energy. That's the static equivalent. So if my cup of coffee is hot, it would be described as having a high thermal energy, which would manifest as a high temperature. But the heat that it gives off is a rate of energy exchange between the coffee and its surroundings. It is heat transfer when it is going from the system to its surroundings. When we are quantifying the characteristics of a system, we are going to be describing those properties using units. And units are an indication of a quantity within a dimension. So here it's important that we take a minute to talk about dimensions and units. For our purposes, we are going to describe dimensions as primary and secondary. A primary dimension is something that is directly measured and cannot be reduced further. We describe four primary dimensions, mass, length, temperature, and time. But there are more. We just don't consider them here. They are outside the scope of our analysis. Secondary dimensions are dimensions that are made up of the primary dimensions. For example, volume is a secondary dimension, and it is made up of length cubed. It is made up of primary dimensions. Force is another secondary dimension. You could describe force as a mass times acceleration. Acceleration would be length per time squared. Therefore, the force dimension would be mass length per time squared. Pressure is a secondary dimension. That would be force per length squared, which would be mass per length time squared. When we are describing dimensions, we are usually quantifying something with units. And just a note, all units are arbitrary. They are not better or worse than each other, but there are different units that are more useful in different circumstances. For example, when we talk about weight, a newton is a manifestation of force that is convenient for calculations because the metric unit system is built so that those calculations are very convenient. However, if you were a 17th century farmer, a newton is a very abstract concept. The pound is defined as an quantity of wheat. I believe it's 7,000, but don't quote me off the top of my head. A pound of force would be the weight of 7,000 grains of wheat taken from the middle of the ear. And if you were a farmer and you were trying to figure out how much wheat you had, you could describe it in pounds of force. That would be more convenient to that person than the Newton. Same goes for temperature scales. When we talk about temperatures, we usually use a relative temperature because it's a little bit more convenient. When I'm describing outside temperature, I could describe that as 300 Kelvin, but that doesn't give a lot of relative perspective between a high temperature and a low temperature. 300 Kelvin versus 350 Kelvin is a lot of temperature difference, but it doesn't seem like much in regard to numbers. The logic of the Fahrenheit temperature scale anymore is that zero represents about the coldest condition that you are going to encounter, at least if you don't live in a lot of very unfortunate places in the world, like for example where I am now, 
and 100 represents about the highest temperature that you're going to be considering, again, unless you live where I live, and therefore you can compare the cold temperature to the hot temperature with a relative scale between them. If I say it's 25 degrees Fahrenheit outside, and tomorrow it will be 75 degrees Fahrenheit, you can make an easy correlation between, oh, that's going to be very hot relative to what it is now. It's going to feel like much hotter than the difference between 300 Kelvin and 325 Kelvin. Same goes for Celsius. For Celsius, we are describing the hot and cold relative states of water. So if zero is the temperature at which water freezes under standard atmospheric pressure, and 100 is the temperature at which water boils under standard atmospheric pressure, then I can easily see how the water in front of me is behaving relative to its freezing and boiling points. If I put a pot of water onto the stove with which to make ramen noodles, and it begins at 20 degrees Celsius, and I heat it up, and it goes from 20 to 30, and then from 30 to 40, I can easily see Ah, I'm like 20% boiling. Now I'm 30% to boiling or 40% to boiling. I am halfway between freezing and boiling when I'm at 50 degrees Fahrenheit. That is the usefulness of that temperature scale. Now for math purposes, neither one of those is good. If it's 25 degrees Fahrenheit outside and I say tomorrow is supposed to be twice as hot, what does that mean? Is it 50 degrees Fahrenheit? Okay, then what about if it was negative 5 degrees Fahrenheit? Does that mean tomorrow's twice as hot, so it's negative 10? No. For math, we are talking about temperature relative to absolute zero. That is actual manifestation of average kinetic energy of the molecules, which is what temperature actually means. We are describing it relative to when there is no motion. So if it's 300 degrees, excuse me, if it's 300 Kelvin out, and tomorrow it's supposed to be twice as hot, twice the thermal energy would mean 600 Kelvin. That would be a very hot day, by the way. Furthermore, when we are talking about units, the arbitrariness of the units pretty much comes down to what's useful for the problem in front of us. But something else to be aware of is that when you are adding and subtracting units, you need them to be the same. The fancy word for that is dimensionally homogeneous. You can't add 5 kilopascals to 5 psi to get 10 kilopascal psi. You need to convert one to the other, or rather, you need to convert them so that they're the same so that you can add them together. When we are keeping track of units and dimensions in our calculations, we are going to be using a representation, a notational scheme called dimensional analysis, where we keep track of the dimensions, or rather, we keep track of what's happening to the dimensions relative to one another, and that makes it much easier for us to convert to different unit systems or even to see where we possibly could have made mistakes. Let's explore that more now.